What's one of the best pieces of advice you got when you reached out to those individuals? Do you remember anything that stood out? Oh, goodness. Or the worst I... piece of advice? That's okay. <laughs> you know, you like, advice, you're like mm, I don't think I'm going to do that one. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Framework Podcast. I'm your co-host, Ana Trujillo-Limon, joined by my other host, Jamie Hopkins. Jamie, welcome to the show. Great to see you. Great to see you, too, Ana. I'm excited about the show today. I love shows where, you know, I know of people uh, and I, I haven't actually got to spend time with them yet. So this is super exciting for me. Yeah, and you will be so excited, Jamie, because Dr. Ryder is the best. Um, we first met back in 2019, so I, I guess I got ahead of myself there. We're joined today <laughs> oh, by no. Dr. Miranda Ryder <laughs> of Texas Tech University. Um, we met way back in 2019 when you won the Best Research Award for our JFP competition in Minnesota and Minneapolis Annual Conference. So right away, it was like, oh man, she's awesome. I'm going to talk to her all night. <laughs> so we had we had a good connection, and, and we've been we've been in communication ever since. So Dr. Ryder, welcome to the show, and thank. Thank you for making time for us. Thank you so much. Um, and it's always really great to see you. You have such great energy and it's exciting to be on the show. Jamie, nice to finally meet you. Yes. No, I'm so excited. So we always like to kick off with the same question Um, we because we gather the best information from this question. But it, what was your first money memory? Yeah. So my first money memory, I, I, I have two that come to my mind. So my first is um, lunch money. My dad would always put lunch money on the wet bar in our living room for us to take to school. Um, and the other memory that I have is this play cash register that I used to have with like fake coins and fake dollars. And um, I had uh, this imaginary store, imaginary clients that also ran out of my parents' living room. Um, and I, I, I love that. So those are my two first real money memories. I love that. We used to have, you know, those like calculators that had the little rolls of paper yes. that you would add up. So my dad had one of those and my sisters and I would pretend to be the ladies from the credit union because they were <laughs> always so stylish. They had the nails done. And so we're like, my mom just told Marbella, one of the ladies, she still works at the credit union, she told Marbella, like, Anna and Andre used to pretend to be you when they were little and with the little register. And anyways, I love those those stories. But it's yeah, good. It's so funny that you say that because I used to take those, I'm dating myself now, but the carbon copy deposit slips from the bank as a kid. <laughs> so that's also a funny memory that I have. That is too funny. I love those things. And like the little roll in the middle of those those rolls of paper for the calculators, because we, we had a lot of, we were very imaginative as kids, right? So we would make like, they were like our scopes for our sniper guns. <laughs> we would play war in the backyard. So it was multi-purpose playing. It was provided a lot of good, that calculator provided a lot of really good fun for us. So I love it, love it. <laughs> is, is that the Fisher Price one? Is that the one, like the, the cash register one with like um, the coins you'd put in the slot? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. I never did you have had, that one too? Oh. No, my cousin did. And I remember, like, I love going to his house. Like, he always had, like, that cousin had, like, cooler toys. Um, so they had that at his house. But I never had one. But I liked that one at his house. I remember the coins you'd push in the, yes. the yes. slot thing. And you could ring it up. And the ding and the door thing would open. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The lunch yeah. money stuff, too. Back in the day, we had chocolate milk and orange juice. Did y'all have that at your school's? Like you would buy it in the morning, yes. and like the 35 cents for the orange juice, but the, yes. you know, quarter for the chocolate milk, man, that was great. My dad would give me 35 cents. Like today I'm getting an orange juice. I'm feeling <laughs> hella fancy. <laughs> so I loved it. So uh, what was your first big or significant purchase that you remember making? Oh, what was my first big purchase? Hmm. I... It, you know, I really, and this is kind of, it's, it's interesting to think about that, but um, I feel like the first biggest thing that I did that was a purchase for me was like the deposit for my first apartment um, post undergrad. Um, up until then, I felt like I didn't really make big pur purchases. My parents were amazing and bought me a car in college. Um, so I had that already, but 
you know, when I graduated and had my very first job in a bank, I had to put a deposit down for my apartment and that was it. Yeah. Jamie, tell, tell her yours. Cause that's always a fun story. <laughs> well, I'm, I will in a second, but I, well, I have something that relates to that. So my, my Halloween costume, part of it showed up today. So I have a Donatello mask behind me today. So uh, that's, that's a good purchase for me this week. I started my pizza. purchasing of Halloween stuff already. Um, it's yeah. So, uh, but the, uh, behind you, is that a conga or the hembe drum? Yeah, I think it's a conga. Okay. Yeah. I can't, yes. it's like few. Yeah, it looks like a conga drum. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I have I, I was a drummer. So I have a Dehembe and I've got my whole drum kit in the basement, but I've got like 13 drums down there. So oh, it's cool. Whole, the whole thing. <laughs> wow. And I have to admit that I do not play that at all. It's my husband's oh. toy. So okay. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's okay. I was going to ask you about that then, because I was like, you know, did you have a memorable first music purchase? Because like that one, I don't think I've ever talked about that one on here. So um, my, mine was that drum kit was the really the first like big music purchase I had. And we didn't have a really big house. And it's also super loud. We didn't have like, we lived in an old farmhouse. So the basement didn't work for like, it's not a good place to hang out. There's snakes and it's gross. Yeah. The no snakes were not in the band. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I actually learned how to play all my drums in the back of a box truck. Um, so like my parents ran a construction company and there was almost always an extra box truck that wasn't in usage. Usually there was a broken down one. So I literally would set up my drums in an empty box truck outside and play in the back of a truck. Yeah. That's neat. Cool. <laughs> we had um my brother was a drummer in the family and we had our which is now the dining room now that we're all grown and out um but we had have that was like the music room we had the piano there and the drum set and it's like I didn't know that was not a normal thing like to like you don't have a whole room dedicated to music in your house what's wrong with you guys but like that was fun so yeah my brother's a drummer um but anyways we'll, we'll get on with the story Jamie you didn't tell your first big purchase story to Dr. Ryder oh well, mine was, uh, so I, I mentioned the Halloween part. Uh, are you a Halloween fan at all, or do you not care about Halloween? Because it's a... I like seeing the kids in the costumes, okay. mostly. That's good. But, and I, I occasionally, I mean, I have won a few contests on Halloween. Oh, so. okay. So you're, you're like, I have won a couple okay. of contests. Uh, well, I want to know your yes. favorite outfit or a costume you've ever had. But mine was a, a fog machine, and I... Um, took my my grandparents never bought us gifts they didn't spend much time with us so they didn't like know what we wanted or like how big we were so they they were like clueless to be able to buy a christmas present but they would send us a check and the check showed up somewhere in between probably it's probably around thanksgiving um you know before christmas and there was like an on sale thing and i bought a fog machine and it worked all the way up until was it 2020 or 21 on because it's after you were here and it broke Yes, twenty twenty two, right? Twenty two. Last okay. summer. It was last summer. Yeah, and then it finally broke. So I had that thing for almost thirty years. Um, wow. And it worked every year. I used it. I we used it with our band a couple of times for some shows. <laughs> it made it like thirty years. I finally got rid of it, and then Anna uh, ordered me a new one, and so that that made its debut. Yeah, that must have been because it made its debut last year, I think, uh, for the awesome. party. Awesome. Continue uh, the memories. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I'm excited for Halloween party this year. I think I'm actually getting a bounce castle. So I'm going one level up from any of my Halloween parties so far. So <laughs> yeah, I'm still trying up. to convince my Jamie, my husband to be I've always wanted to be Hans and Franz for Halloween. And I'm this close to getting him to do it this year. We'll see. But, but we digress. <laughs> we'll get back to the point. <laughs> So, Dr. Ryder, tell us about, like, what, what did you want to be when you were little growing up, and how did you come to be a, a professor at Texas Tech? Yeah, so I think that um, I probably went from an, more of an optimist as a kid to more of a realist when I transitioned into my current profession, probably, you know, similar to a lot of us, but I dreamed of being an Olympic uh, gymnast, even though I was, you know, kind of tall. Yeah. And really didn't have a lot of gymnastic classes, but that's really what I wanted to be. I would admire these 80s, uh, those those famous gymnasts from the 80s and the 90s. Um, 
so that was kind of the first thing that I really wanted to do. And then um, when I was in high school, I started to realize that I really had uh, an affinity for foreign languages. And so I thought, you know, I'd be a translator and be this globetrotter and have some sort of international career. Um, and then I, I thought, you know, I could probably do all that while being a psychologist. And I went to school for language and also business. And so uh, my first job was in banking and finance. And um, I think eventually I realized that I really loved finance. It, it was not on my radar and education um, came into my world at some point as well. And I thought, okay, well, the two favorite things that I feel like I love other than you know, language is education and finance. And what's the best way that I can do that? Let's check out the professor route. And so that's kind of the short story to how I got to where I am now. Yeah. Um, there was one time we, we talked, um, for the next generation planner, it was way back when you, yes, I think when you first started at Texas Tech. And I remember you told me that like, misconceptions people have about pursuing a PhD is that it's the next logical step in the education journey. And you kind of, so I, I wanted to share, the, I wanted you to share that perspective with people that it's kind of, it's, that's not it at all. It's like, it's like a whole different world. So, so talk to us a little bit about that. Yes, absolutely. I think that's such a great point. Um, and, and now in my role, I have other people, you know, contacting me and asking me, Hey, I see that, you know, you were in the industry and now you're a professor and, um, I'm also interested in, you know, taking my education to the next level. And I think, uh oh, no, no, let's explain this. And so um, what I learned um, before the PhD, because I had friends and had exposure to it, um, was that really the, the PhD is, is for a person that wants to understand how to conduct research and do it themselves. I mean, it really is that. And so there's, you know, there's a, somehow a notion that you'll get more, you'll get more knowledge and wisdom and understanding about your profession or your occupation and what you do. And while the PhD can in some maybe indirect ways assist, it doesn't really give you, um, it didn't make me a better financial planner per se as a practitioner, but what it really did was made me a researcher and made me understand um, the fundamentals of research, how to conduct research, how to understand research from reports and, and all of those things. And so I remember in my master's program, my mentor was a professor and she said at the time, and I asked her, it was in my late twenties. And I said, you know, do you think I should pursue a PhD if I don't like research? Because for whatever reason, I thought I didn't like research at that time. And she said, absolutely not. And I was kind of bummed, but I realized later that she was, she was right. She was absolutely right. And somehow um, I absolutely love research more than I could have ever imagined. So for me, it was perfect. So, um, Dr. Ryder, I know you do a lot of really amazing research in the DEI space, and this month, um, it's September right now, and so we're kind of tackling on framework the topic of DEI in the profession. Um, so, just been been having a lot of really great conversations around that. So, I just wanted to to I was curious about the research that you're working on now first, and then we'll we'll go into some of the stuff you've done and some of the practical takeaways. Sure. Um, so I am, um, my very first research um, paper that I wrote, um, that I published on diversity, equity, inclusion, and financial planning was exploring um, the pipeline. I really was, you know, before I entered the PhD program, that was one of the big questions that was on my mind as having been a practitioner and really just kind of anecdotally you know, making an assessment of my environment and trying to understand why it really wasn't diverse, uh, why I didn't feel included, you know, and I didn't have really anything to turn to. And so I had this big question that I wanted to chip away at as a researcher was what, what, is, what contributes to the lack of diversity in financial planning? That was my big overarching question. And it is phenomenal because I applied to the PhD program in 2014 and had to write my essay. And there was there was really nothing outside of the gender conversation. We have so much more now. But getting back to this first paper, so that first paper examined 
um, the pipeline into the undergraduate programs and what are programs doing to actually um, support DEI. And so now um, I am currently building on that work to understand more about um, what it takes to successfully maintain uh, CFP board registered programs, particularly with diverse students in mind. And also the kind of flip side of that is I'm looking at how can we best engage those students, underrepresented students, marginalized students, when they're in those programs to make sure that they're retained? Are they getting what they need in terms of mentorship and um, inclusion in their internships and, and all sorts of things? So that's where I am now with, with my research. You probably have, uh, I think I looked at your, you have about a dozen or so probably published papers. I'm sure you're working on some other ones that are always in the pipeline now. Is there a finding or an outcome of any of the papers you've published so far that you found to be like the most surprising? Because uh, I always like those. I mean, a lot of times, right, we we come up with our theories of what they're going to be. We lay out our hypothesis and then it's maybe close, even if we were wrong. Uh, but has there been one, anything that you've done so far that just was really far outside of what you thought you were going to find? Yes. Yes. Um, I really love that question. Um, so with research, it's sometimes quite a surprise. I mean, we go in it hoping to find something. I mean, we really should not, we should be more open, but generally we, we yeah. go in hoping to find a certain <laughs> thing. Um, and so there's one research paper um, that was published last year in the journal Financial Therapy. And that paper is looking at the intersectionality of race and gender uh, when exploring who seeks financial advice. And um, we really were trying to piece out when we look at, um, this paper just looked at black and white uh, respondents. Um, and what we saw was that there is something there that shows that when you control for certain var variables, the group out of black men, black women, white women, and white men that would be more likely to seek advice if all things were equal, which we know in real life, all things are not equal, but it was black women. That's totally surprising. I mean, that is not who I saw walking into the doors of uh, financial, my, even my own financial yeah. planning practice. It's just not what I think people tend to have in mind as a client. But uh, the statistics shows us that if we control for all these things, we make education the same, we make income the same, we control for wealth, we control for all these things. Um, we have a client that I feel like it's just not really thought of as a client. Yeah. So where we go from there, I, I think there's more to dig into, but that was to me pretty, pretty surprising. Yeah. What are, can, can I ask you a couple of follow-ups there or Anna, do you have something no, you go can ahead. go if you want to? Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Cause uh, that's super interesting. And it's kind of maybe one of those examples of where like our anecdotal life evidence is telling us a different story because mm -hmm. like, to your point, like it's not all equal. So we know that that black women aren't equal in those categories, right? So like as a percentage, they're not going to fall into there. So then our life experience is telling you that like, well, that's probably not the case because I don't see that many but it's probably more of just a pure numbers thing than in, you know, who's actually that fits that mold. Right. And I think that's probably one of those examples of like, to that point of like our bias going into research, you'd be like, well, mm -hmm. this is who I see. So I expect to see that show up in the research too. There mm -hmm. was, um, yeah, there was, uh, so Dr. Julie Raggetts and I, who's, who's at Carson, we were at American college together. We did a survey on like, ethical issues in financial services and like we we were like really excited to write this article about how there was all these pervasive ethical dilemmas and like it came back and like it really wasn't that bad <laughs> and, like the paper was like really boring because it was like ah, eh, we're really not any worse than any other like professional industry <laughs> so yeah. it was just kind of like we're kind of just the same issues that every other like profession faced we did and it wasn't any worse and we were kind of like because we just had this assumption like oh we're not as professional so we're going to be like way more like littered with these ethical issues and it just fell right in line with everybody and it was kind of like <laughs> super disappointing to write a paper that was like we're the same <laughs> like yeah like it was really funny yeah <laughs> So 
Dr. Uh, Ryder, what are some of the like practical takeaways from the research that you mentioned, both like in terms of the students, like better serving them, supporting them, and then in terms of like the firms and, and supporting employees and things like that? Yeah, sure. So um, with a paper that I was speaking about, um, underrepresented students in these undergraduate programs, what I learned, that paper was published in 2020, um, and the data collected for that was pre-COVID. Um, but, but what I learned from that is that among the programs that responded, um, more of those programs were focusing on, if they focused on diversity, were focusing on gender-based diversity rather than racial ethnic diversity. And so um, that was an interesting takeaway too, because of course it could kind of, you know, it, that's probably what we'd expect given what the numbers look like in, in, in the field. Um, and so one of the takeaways from that paper was that, well, um, if there is going to be a change um, with representation, then there needs to be some sort of intentionality, even at the uh, undergraduate level. I mean, it can't, we cannot wait until individuals get into firms to start talking about DEI. So that was one of the takeaways from that. I think uh, another takeaway that came out of some papers that were connected to my dissertation, um, which I think that aren't necessarily surprising, but it's just really, it was interesting to see. I was trying to understand dynamics between race and gender and choosing a financial planner. And I wasn't able to capture any race effects like I thought I would. Um, and to Jamie's question, asking about some things that were surprising from that study, um, black financial uh, professionals uh, were rated higher in their competence levels that, than white professionals. That was really surprising. I still haven't necessarily uh, figured out exactly why. I think there could be some sort of uh, star effect where they think, oh, okay, I see a person with a CFP and they have an MBA and they have to be black. Oh my gosh. Um, so so there, there's that. But that the, another takeaway from that was that um, all individuals were more comfortable with a woman as a financial planner. And um, I, I think we have evidence of this elsewhere, but this study kind of continued to um, confirm that. More likely to work with women and uh, more trusting in, in women financial advisors. So those are some of the takeaways. And um, I'm looking to do more to understand more about workplace, which um, I haven't been able to enter that space yet, but looking more to, to go there and understand more about those dynamics. So I'm not super surprised. I'll tell a story. This kind of sounds bad, but I'm going to tell it anyway. I love seeing non-white pilots when I get on planes because my assumption is that they had to overcome a lot to get all the way there. And they're probably like the best pilots in the world. <laughs> and like, I totally just like, I'm like, yeah, like that's a super hard place to get to. And so you're probably awesome. So like women pilots, same thing. I'm like, they're probably amazing. And like, yeah. I'm like every time I'm like, Hey, that's great. I feel a lot safer on this flight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah it's a nasty, safe assumption. Right? <laughs> I think yeah. it's a safe assumption. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's probably it's probably very accurate. I know that uh, military pilots tend to be really strong, and non-white pilots and women pilots had to overcome a lot to get there. So it's it, I feel very safe. <laughs> yeah, interesting point. Yeah, yeah. So that it's it's interesting. We interviewed Dr. Terrence Martin um, yesterday, um, and so uh, la well, aired last week. Um, so we. we that word intentionality and the intentionality um, has come up a lot in these mm -hmm. interviews we've done for this month. Um, and so I was curious about your perspective. Like I feel, and this is, I'm not a researcher, so it's purely anecdotal, mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that lately, um, especially I think since the Supreme Court struck down affirmative action, like it feels like, it feels like there's this collective, oh, we don't, it's only a matter of time before we don't have to care about diversity anymore. Like if it's a general feeling that I'm getting from a lot, even, you know, um, planning a Latino based event, like that's a lot of, Oh, we've already done what we needed to do for black and brown people this year. We can't help you. Like that's like been a lot of the response. Um, so I'm just curious about your perspective, just, just, just based on, you know, what you're seeing and things like that on, do you think, this is the road we're heading down, like where people and companies are just going to be like, you know what, we don't really care about it anymore. It's not really 
what we need to do. And, and that's, I'm very scared for that to happen, but I'm just curious about your perspective on that. Yeah, Anna, um, I, I appreciate that question because I do think it's um, in the back of people's minds who are aware of mm -hmm. um, the need and um, the climate that we're in. And unfortunately, I, I, I do agree with you in that some of those decisions will be made. People will step away. People will be afraid um, to continue talking about this. Mm -hmm. However, I think that, sure, the climate is what it is, and it is so hard sometimes. Um, I'm in the state of Texas. Um, we, this state just um, passed a bill that there can be no diversity, equity, and inclusion offices on any public university campuses. And, um, you know, and that, that bill cover, covers a number of things. It, it protects research. It, it does protect teaching. But you can imagine that people like me who teach and do research around diversity feel apprehensive about yeah. uh, certain things now moving forward. Um, but I, I do absolutely believe that these would be short-sighted moves because, yeah. you know, it's uh, the amazing thing is when I think about my conscious life of, as an adult and the progress that has been made in a lot of these areas, there's been successes, there's no doubt. And right now I feel like there's there's a backlash. You know, we've taken some steps forward and now we're taking some steps back, but it's short-sighted. And if people wanna hang it up for a short time, it's only to get it back out because it's not going away. It's just not, like it's not going away. So, you know. Yeah. And I'm curious about your perspective on like, I guess going back to the students um, and, and you had brought that up earlier about, you know, we can't just wait till they're in the workplace. Like, so, so talk to us a little bit about some of the work that needs to be done and how our listeners who are primarily advisors and firm owners can kind of step in and, and help with that type of work when it comes to students, your students and all students. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that, um, when we think about students, you know, they, they are the few, they are the future of, of the industry. I think there's so much there with, with all of the ideas and the thoughts they have. And I feel like it's precious. It needs to be nurtured. Um, they need mentors. They need people that they can reach out to. And I think that one of the best things that, um, practitioners can do is to be open and, and available um, for opportunities to connect. I was not a student when I became, um, I was not a financial planning student um, when I became a financial, um, I was not a financial planning student, I'm sorry, just before I became a financial uh, advisor. But there was a point where I was kind of making a career transition and I needed to reach out to some people to ask questions about being a solo practitioner and what kind of firms should I connect with and all these things. And I really was uh, just kind of reaching out there to strangers on the internet and LinkedIn. And thank goodness that I, uh, some great people replied and said, yes, I'd be happy to talk to you. Yes, I can you know, call you. And so I have not forgotten that. And I think that we can, it, it's, it's, maybe underestimated just what that, you know, handing out that that bridge can do for students, for young people who are in, interested in this amazing profession. What's one of the best pieces of advice you got when you reached out to those individuals? Do you remember anything that stood out? Oh, goodness. Or the worst I... piece of advice. That's okay. <laughs> that was like too far. Like, mm, I don't think I'm going to do that one. <laughs> You know, I don't remember anything that was terrible or anything that was great. I, I honestly remember most being surprised that people were being so honest with me. Mm. I, I, you know, I, and they didn't know me and they wanted me to succeed. That's what was the most shocking thing to me. So it was just... Like, wow, I feel so grateful. And I've been grateful that I could 
um, be that for somebody else. So when people contact me now, you know, I, if I have the time, I'm going to talk to them about this profession, you know? Yeah. I Same. I enjoy that. I love when people reach out and they're like, Oh, do you have some time? Yes, I do. I would love to talk to you. And it's, it's fun. Cause I feel like it builds community too. Cause it's a lot of times it's young Latino students or young Latino professionals who will reach out to me and be like, Hey, I didn't, I didn't realize there were so many of us in this industry. And then it's like, it's nice. Cause it, it has, we, we have been able to build a community. And I think that speaks volumes for retention in the, in the space to have that community to move through together. So yeah, that's really neat. Absolutely. Well, we get a lot of FinServe students that now listen to this. So reach out to both Anna and Dr. Ryder now. You can just go ahead and do it. We tell we tell people <laughs> in that program all the time, reach out and you'll be surprised that people take the time to talk to you. We do. And yeah. we do have the mentorship program with FinServe. I just scheduled my, my first mentor session with my mentee for FinServe Foundation. So I'm excited about that. So That's awesome. That intent, we're trying to be more intentional, right? The mentorship program. Yes. <laughs> Love I mean, it. That's been that's been my favorite thing in this past month. So we matched seventy four um, students to mentors this last month. Um, we actually ended up with about ninety five or ninety six uh, financial service professionals that volunteered to be mentors, which was awesome because when we started it, we were like, "How are we going to get seventy five people to come do this?" And we actually got wow. over what we needed. And uh, wow. yeah, but. It's going to be a challenge because we will we'll probably have a we're over 200 students in FinServe and we'll be adding another 100 um, next semester. Uh, it looks like it'll probably land about 100. So we'll have over 300 uh, students out there in financial planning programs in the uh, in the program. So it's exciting, but it comes with its own new challenges moving forward. So mentors, Absolutely. we're still going to need mentors. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so Dr. Ryder, do you, I know it's it's only been what, um, three, almost four years um, mm -hmm. there at Texas Tech. So I'm not sure if this question might be relevant, but have you have you heard from students who have graduated and gone into the space, like things that, that maybe they are needing in terms of support or things like that, that um, companies, firms and, and such should look to providing? Yeah, I, you know, I what's really incredible. I, I I have to say, I mean, I'm at Texas Tech for a reason, and it's and it's has a lot to do with what they've been able to do over the past few decades with this financial planning program. I mean, they just have so many mechanisms of support for students. Um, we have uh, Fall Career Day where we have all these employers that they come and speak with students and hire them. And so um, I really feel like students are able to get, you know, really so much that they need um, through our program so that they're prepared once they are in their internships or once they're in their first jobs. Um, so I have to say that I feel like our students don't have so many surprises, you know, when they get out there, they're, they're really well equipped. And I know that's not the, the same um everywhere, but um, we do a lot here at Texas Tech to make sure our students understand um, what they are going to be facing and um, have them to do as much as they can within the program um, to ask questions and have those internship experiences. Yeah. Tech is such a strong program and, and we need uh... Yeah, you know, I think we talked about this some of the other episodes. We need we need like five techs out there too <laughs> next, right? Like we, and yeah. that's the thing is like it's a great model and UVU for building these up, but we need five more schools to come along and also be supported like that and have resources because you guys do you you all there do such a great job with the students of bringing professionals into this, you know, uh, industry and doing it the right way, and they come out. You know, we I get to work with some, and then they come out ready you know i mean it's uh, and that's not true with every program out there today so you're doing a great job and thanks for being part of that thank you so much awesome so dr Ryder, we want to be mindful of your time we know you're pretty busy school year just started and such um so so jamie are there any final questions you wanted to ask before we get uh, to our, one did. of our favorites I had one more. Okay, so, let's go, I, I go looked, for it. I looked at your bio <laughs> right before we were starting. So you had, um, I believe, what uh, what the great courses come out, right? Like, uh, so what did you launch there this year? You, I think that's this year, right? In 2023? Yes, yes. Oh, that's, 
I love that question because it's just one of my favorite things, projects that I've worked on. And so uh, the great courses reached out and asked if I was interested in writing an audiobook of personal finance. Um, and they really wanted it to be at the level of um, kind of younger or if not young in age, but maybe young to uh, personal financial management. And so uh, I spent last year writing that book, uh, that audio book, and then um, went up to their studios and narrated it. And it came out this year. But um, I'm really so proud of it because, you know, there's a handful of people who might read my research papers. And with that audio book, <laughs> I know that it's going to be more than that. So, yeah, <laughs> so that makes me happy to know that my work is getting uh, consumed by more than just a handful of people. Yeah. When you check your SSRN downloads and it's like 28 and it's like your favorite thing you've ever read it. And you're like, there's only 28 people that have read this. So it's, uh, what is it? Six ways to manage your money or something close to that? Yes. Okay. So what are the, what are the six? You know, that's that. Oh, goodness. I don't remember the first pop quizzes on framework. (laughs) It's a new segment. (laughs) The first one is to know yourself, really to know yourself financially. And so with that very first chapter, I I, I tap into uh, financial socialization, thinking about how you grew up with money, thinking about how money makes you feel, thinking about your financial behaviors, the things that you've done in the past, accepting that truth and knowing it and moving forward from there. So that's that's the that's the introduction. Well, that's good. That's a teaser for everybody to go yeah. check it out. Then that's the right way to do it. So, get yeah. it. Where where can you find that? Like, where where where's the best way to for our listeners to check it out? Yeah. So the best place to find it is on Audible dot com okay. or on Amazon dot com. Okay. Yep. Awesome. Six ways to manage your money under great courses. Oh, we do have actually one more before our final question. Um, so we do, we, we've been doing a segment, um, a flip the script. If you have a question that you would like to ask Jamie and myself, we would love to give you the opportunity to do so. Okay. Well, I would like to know um, what is the most um, maybe interesting dialogue or question or proposition that you've had on this podcast? Go ahead, Jamie. Do you know what you're <laughs> was trying to think? I'll probably have to try to think through most interesting. Uh, trying to go through some of the ones. So you know what? Like, I will tell you, Anna, I, and I think that, uh, uh, what's his name? I'm going to draw a blank here. Excel last year. That was my favorite conversation oh, that we've had. Yeah. Uh, uh, Tucker, right? Tucker um, Bryant. Yeah, Tucker, Tucker Bryant. Tucker Bryant. He's yeah, a poet. Tucker Bryant. And He's a poet. We had so much fun with him. And so here's the funny thing. It was the best episode we've ever recorded and it didn't record. Oh no. And we, re, we had to reshoot the episode by faking the conversation that we had. Like, oh, right? what do we say next? What? Yeah. Like yeah. we had, and it was literally like, and that's how the world goes, right? It's literally the best podcast we ever recorded. He wrote up, he wrote a poem on the, Thing and read it out mm-hmm. loud we had a crazy conversation about the tooth fairy which is that's the most memorable one i've ever had like it was <laughs> hilarious like we were all like dying laughing um and he's just a real like he has a great story and he's very thoughtful and it just like we went we went to a thousand different places and uh that most of the episode recorded i should say but this the whole first part didn't record and we had to like go back and fake it it turned out well but like it was just funny that like we had this amazing organic conversation around yeah. life and, you know, trauma and overcoming things. And then we had to go back and like, what did we say right after that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was an interesting one. Yeah, I think for me, mine was Dr. Loving. Uh, we had Dr. Loving on the show at Excel and it was one of my very first episodes and it was my very first episode by myself <laughs> so mm. it was terrifying but it was fun <laughs> because it was it was Dr. Loving and you know him he's all yeah. full of energy and life yes. and and so I think I had asked him about his first big purchase a significant purchase and it was one of those eight ball jackets you know like the leather mm. jackets with and I just cracked up because he's, he's so professional and buttoned up and then like to picture him <laughs> in one of those fun colorful jackets it's like like oh that's interesting Dr. Loving I love it <laughs> <laughs> 
And Dr. Ryder, the other thing I will tell you, and Anna has heard this from me before too, is I like interviewing writers the most um, because they, what I, and I tell people this all the time and I did it FPA next gen is, um, but it comes across in interviewing people that they have clear takeaways and stories just like you did um, because you've had to write it down. You've had to put it on paper and mm -hmm. it makes interviewing people a lot easier because sometimes we interview great people, but they struggle to like give you the point of their story and like mm -hmm. have a takeaway because they know it, but they haven't been forced to put it down. And so I always come away from authors and writers tend to be my favorite episodes. So that's a, that's an interesting thing that's come out of the show over time. And uh, it's also very clear that the, our, the most famous people we have don't always make the best interviewers either. Um, so we've had a little bit of that where we've been super excited to interview people. Then they're kind of like, we're both like looking at each other, like mm. <laughs> they really didn't have anything to say, did they? <laughs> yeah. So that's safe so to say that Dr. Ryder, this is one of Jamie's fav favorite yeah. episodes then because, you know, it's on that list. <laughs> oh, Lord. that is so nice. That is so nice of you. Oh, <laughs> so, well, this was so much fun. And I always appreciate, you know, you spending some time with us. Um, so where's the best place for people to connect with you? Is that LinkedIn, Twitter, or I'm sorry, X? <laughs> Yes, X, which I think made me realize that I have to take a step back, um, realize the generation that I'm in, and I'm no longer adding new ones to my list. Yeah. So I'm going to just uh, stick with my conservative LinkedIn. <laughs> and so yes. that's the best place to connect with me. Okay, awesome. Yeah, LinkedIn's my favorite too. I spend most of my day on there just, you know, having a good time connecting with people. Exactly. So well, so we'll, we'll wrap it up with, um, you know, tying it into what we do here at Carson, which is helping clients and helping people find their freedom. So we always like to ask people, what does that term finding your freedom mean to you? Yes. Um, for me, it means peace with how I'm living my life. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yep. Perfect, concise beautiful and to answer. the point. Love it. Well, that's the perfect way to cap off the episode, Dr. Ryder. Thank you so much. And Jamie, thank you so much for making time for us today. And everybody else, thank you for listening to this episode. Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss another one.